I will define these terms as the talk goes along. So it will be a mix between combinatorics and algebra. So we'll see along. So I will define the, this class of monoids I will call good monoids, which is not a standard term, but <laughs> it will be an easy term to remember. We give some examples of these good monoids. So the main one I will study in the second part of the talk will be the bierman cowley monoid, which is related to the famous combinatorial objects that are non-crossing partitions. And I will give briefly, if time allows, so, uh, an idea of uh, the algebraic interpretation of the main result, in fact, of uh, this talk. So, I don't know if everyone is familiar with monoids, so I will recall some, some things. A monoids just it's like a group, but you don't have inverses, so it means you have an internal law which is associative, and that admits uh, an identity element. So there's a notion of divisibility in monoids. We say that M divides N uh, if uh, there, is ex there exists an element such that M times U is equal to N. So it's a left divisor, but everything will be left divisors here. So I, I would just say divides. Uh, let's see if I can use this. So a monoid will define some properties, and all these properties together will define what is a good monoid. Okay, so. Left cancellability means that if you have uh, an identity um, a m equals a n, then you can simplify by a, and you uh, it gives m equals n. So this is always possible in groups, of course, because you multiply by the inverse. But it's quite a strong property for monoids. Uh, what I what is called an atom is a monoid is a sort of an irreducible element. So it's an element different from the identities, such that if you can write it as a product then one of the two factors must be one. So it cannot be decomposed in a non-trivial product. Okay. Uh, a monoid is called atomic, so it means, so this condition is really if you want to do enumeration, so it's uh, some finiteness conditions. Okay. It's called atomic if you take any element, there is a finite number of ways to write it as a product of atoms. Okay. This only a number, finite number of decompositions like this where the AIs are the irreducible elements, the atoms. And we also assume that the atoms are in finite number and that they generate M. This means that there is at least one way to write every element as a product of atoms, okay? So it's a finite, finite, non-empty non number of ways, if you want, non-zero. So we have left cancellability, atomicity, and then property L, it, L, I don't know, L is for lattice because it's related to lattice in some, uh, we will see this, but it's also not standard notation. We, we won't find it anywhere else in the literature, I think. So if, if you take any subset of the set of atoms, and if all of them admit a common multiple, that is an element uh, such that every element of J device uh, this 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 element, then they in fact admit a list common multiple. That is, a uh, multiple of all of these atoms that divides all other common multiples. That clear? So it's the common notion in the integers of a list common multiple. So property sa says that if you have a common multiple, then you have a least one, one that divides all the other, a smallest one, if you want. Um, so what is a good monoid for me? It's a monoid that is, as like I said, it is atomic, has a left cancellability property, and has property L. So from now on, all monoids will be good, in fact. Okay. So some notations. If S is the set of atoms of the monoid M, uh, we will call cliques. So this is related to cliques in graphs in general, but we'll not go into details. The subsets of atoms, okay, such that uh, they have a common multiple. So the ones that appear in property L, okay. So property L, property L, so sorry, tells that these cliques also have a common multiple by definition, okay. So it's exactly what uh, property L says, and we will call uh, J like this the the set of all cliques, all cliques. 
And if j is a clique, we, we will not mj, okay, this unique list common multiple that it uh, has. Actually, I didn't say it was unique, but it is unique because of the left cancellability property. Okay, so there's, there's a uniqueness of this list common multiple. Okay. And will not mj, I'm sorry, I did, didn't define the length, I will define it afterwards. Uh, mj doesn't always exist. Okay. So a bit of algebra, if you take now the set of all infinite linear combinations of elements of m, okay? Uh, you can define a product on them, just you take any f two, two finite linear combinations and you define a product by the coefficient which is equal to simply, it's just an extension of the product of the monoid, okay? So it means that uh, you take all elements x, y um, belonging to m such that their product is equal to m and you multiply the corresponding coefficients. Okay, I will not. Uh, and this is not always well defined because you could have an infinite sum here, okay? And this would not make any sense. But when m is atomic, so in particular when m is a good monoid, then this sum will be finite and this, define, this defines a uh, good product so that it makes this into a, a ring, okay? An algebra ring, okay? So now I have everything and I can state the main result. So it states that if you consider the, 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 um, the algebra Z, Zm, then you have the following simple relation. So what does it tell us? This is a product between two elements of uh, this algebra. I tell you that if you take here the, the sum, okay, the, the, the formal infinite linear sum of all, e all elements, okay, which is, it's a good normal, uh, it's actually uh, an infinite linear combination with, where every element has coefficient one, okay? Then it says that it's the right inverse of this, which is the sum over all clicks of uh, minus, um, minus one to the size of the click, meaning the number of atoms, okay? Clicks are subsets of atoms, uh, times the, the, the least common multiple of J, okay? So, actually, this is strong because this is a finite sum, okay? Because the set of atoms is finite, so the number of clicks is finite. So it says that this sum has a, a left inverse that is finite because it's equal to the identity. We will actually use, first I will prove it, but we will mo mostly use it uh, for some property, for some monoids with an additional property called homo um, Homogene homogeneousness, I'm not sure it's the right word. So I will, I will give a corollary soon. So how to prove this, okay? You just have to prove it, look at the coefficients on both sides, okay? The coefficients of any given element M. So it's really easy to see that this is ident exactly the same thing as proving this identity for any M. So it's the sum of minus one to the size of j over all, cop uh, all pairs j m prime such that m j m prime equal m. This is exactly what appears when you multiply everything here. And this is zero if m is different than one and one if m equals one, I mean the identity, because this is exactly the, the coefficients of m here, okay? One has coefficient one and all the other uh, elements of the monoids have coefficient zero. And to prove this, uh, is actually quite easy. Uh, uh, if you define j, j of m as the, the click, actually the maximal one, the biggest click, uh, meaning that any two elements here have a common multiple, such that uh, m j of m divides m. Okay, it's well defined, but it means it's really easy to check, and it's when you have this, you can rewrite this sum like this. And if you think about it, this is just a sum over all subsets of a given set. Okay? And you put a weight minus one to the order of the set. And this is well known. This is just actually the number of uh, even sets, the sets with even cardinal, minus the sets, number of sets with odd cardinal. And as everyone knows, it's quite easy to prove that if the set is not empty, this is zero. And if the set is empty, this is one because it's just one term. So this is 
exactly what it tells because j of m is exactly non-empty when m uh, is different than, than 1. So the proof is actually very easy. I, I didn't detail this part, but this really uh, uses the properties of good monoids in an essential way. Okay. Uh, so is it also true if we change the order of the multiplication? No. No, no, it's uh, just a right inverse. Okay. But actually we will... So this is non-commutative, okay? This is, we really have to think about non -com Everything I will do today will be non-commutative in, in the monoids, okay? Hmm? Um, yes, I think that's uh, yeah. That's the only thing that uh, uses the order. I think, but it's not really important. I don't really need it. Okay, this order is good. Uh, the length. So there are some monoids where if you write m as a product of atoms, all such decompositions have the same number of atoms. So this is a good situation. And we, in this case, we call L the length of M. Uh, and we write, uh, write it like this. And in this case, we say that uh, M is a homogeneous monoid. So it really means that every time you, you write it as product of atoms, the, the number of atoms is well defined the same. So in this case, you can really use the, the previous result and, um, and apply the homomorphism which to M uh, associates T to the length of M. And just applying this homomorphism gives you that if you take the generating function of M, uh, this is what I will call the growth function that's in the title. So the generating function of M according to the length of elements, so this S is Okay, you can forget about it. It means length according to S, but uh, it's the same as this one. So if you take this generating function, it's equal to the inverse of this polynomial. Okay, J is a finite uh, set, so this is a polynomial, uh, which is exactly the... Remember before we had MJ, so now we just take T to the length of MJ, which is this little MJ that I defined meaning. So this is what I will use mostly. So remember, we want to compute the growth function, meaning how many elements of a given length there are, and you make a generating function of this. And this says that it's, this is equal to the inverse of polynomial, and this is what we will want to, to compute. I will make a, a long example in the second part, which is how to compute this, uh, how to find the clicks, and to find the length here and to determine exactly what is this polynomial explicitly in some cases, okay? So some examples, uh, sorry, first uh, relation with process that is actually related to the previous talk, we'll see. The fact, uh, being a good monoid also means that there is a natural process uh, related to divisibility. If you said that M in the monoid is smaller than M prime if M divides M prime, okay, this makes it into a process. You can verify that the transitivity things, everything works perfectly well, and this makes M into a process. And it's actually ranked, meaning there's a rank function like we had in the previous talk, if the monoid is homogeneous and the, the rank in the process is exactly the, the length of the, of the element. And so what is the relation with what, what I said before? It's that... Mm, so recall the Möbius function, which was already defined in the previous talk, so it's exactly the same thing. And the Möbius function is actually, if you take the, the sum, okay, the elements in this infinite linear combination algebra, okay, this sum is exactly uh, uh, the, the quantity we had before, okay, the inverse of the sum over all m. So it means the, the, the Möbius function is really related to these questions of growth functions, etc. And uh, the same thing if you apply, uh, if you apply the homomorphism which to m associ associates t to the power of uh, length of m, then you will also get that the generating the growth function of the monoid is equal to the inverse of this thing, and this is nothing else than the char character characteristic polynomial that we that we had before. Okay, in general. 
but this is just I, I will not use it uh, I will not use the Mobius function but I will use the fact that uh, we have a poset here and it's we can do computations in in the poset some examples uh, so the original example the, the starting point of this work which was actually my co-author's work at the beginning is trace monoids also called cartier fouata monoids or partial commutation monoids so someone has heard of this you take a finite set and a relation in, of on on this set which is symmetric and anti-reflexive means that x is never in relation with x okay and you can define uh, monoid with this so it's j oh sorry it's, it shouldn't be m it should be s here okay it's s is al always my generating set so the monoid generated by s and with relations a b equals b a uh, exactly when a b belongs to i is called a trace monoid so what is this monoid maybe you're not familiar with relations in monoids it means that really s is a generating set and every time you have something like this a b with a b and i you can replace it in the word by b a and you can do and all these words are equivalent okay so you define an equivalent relation equivalence relation on words like this and just by applying these rules uh, whenever you can just a quick example if s has three elements and you say that this will mean that a commutes with b so will you will have exactly this relation a b equals b a what are the words here the, uh, if, you, if, you, if you look at uh, they are generated by s so they are words in a b c but whenever you have a b or b a in the world you're allowed to make them commute to write a b equals b a etc and the, the equivalence classes that you get are the, the the elements of the monoids okay so the fact is that to this for this monoids we can apply what you had before because they are good monoids and they are also homogeneous okay which is when you have this kind of uh, um, presentation okay generators and relations it's immediate that it's a homogeneous monoid because you don't change the length when you do this you never change the number of atoms in the monoids so they are good monoids homogeneous so we can apply the corollary that we had before to compute the growth function of this uh, kind of monoids uh, okay so this what I said we will use that the inverse sorry it should be the inverse of this as we saw is the inverse of this polynomial is the growth function of the wind, meaning the generating functions of elements according to their length. So the sum is over clicks. Clicks are, uh, recall uh, again, click means that all pairs of elements, um, no, sorry, a click in general means that uh, all elements in the, in, in, in the subset have a common uh, multiple, okay? But in this case, having a common multiple is equivalent to the fact that they all commute together so they all are in this uh, commutation relation uh, uh, i okay so in this case clicks means every uh, all elements commutes between them and then the lowest common multiple is just the product of the elements of course you can do the product in any order because they commute all of them and so its length is exactly the cardinal cardinality of j okay so in my example, the clicks, so I recall the, the only commutation relation we had was A, B equals B, A, okay? So this is a click, okay? A, B, C are clicks, okay? Because they, they have a common multiple, which is A, B, C. Now we have A and B, uh, which form a click, and their least common multiple is just A, B, or B, A, just a multiple of both of them. But we cannot have A and C, or B and C, which are not good and we cannot either have a b and c okay so these are all the clicks now we compute this sum which is gives immediately uh, 1 minus 3 t plus t squared okay 3 correspond to this 3 here and t squared correspond to this okay the square here means that the the mj associated to this is of size is of length uh, 2 so the gross function is this and if you compute it you find 1 plus 3 and extra and I think these are odd Fibonacci numbers, I think. So there should be an easy proof of this. And actually, I'm yeah, pretty sure it's been made before, but I <laughs> can be a good exercise to try to find out wha why this, the number of elements of length n in the monoid is equal to, let's say, Fibonacci f2n plus 1, or something like this. Okay, this 
is what turns. There must be a, an easy bijective proof of this. Okay. Um, another class that's quite a, it's been defined in the uh, 90s actually, Garcine monoids, they came up in <coughs> works on coxeter groups, etc. Um, uh, monoid, so it's an atomic left conservative monoid such that any two elements have left and right left common multiple, so you can easily see what uh, right left common multiple are, I just define left ones. So already they are atomic left conservative, so I mean there's also another property for garside, uh, garside monoids, so it admits a garside element means that uh, an element whose sets of left and right divisors coincide and such that the, the set of uh, divisors is finite and generates M. Okay, it's not really important. I just give you the definition for completeness. But the fact is that these Garside monoids are also good monoids. So they have, so we already have the first two atomic, you know, and left conservative properties. We also need this property L on subsets of atoms, and it's, it can be shown that they are, they are good monoids. And in fact, all subsets of S are cliques, you know. You can take any subset of S, it admits a common multiple, which is a really an easy uh, <laughs> corollary, corollary to, to, this, uh, to this thing. So in the case of Garcia monoids, any subset of atoms, any of the two power uh, cardinal, cardinal of S subset of atoms is a clique, okay? So the sum that we have, sum over all cliques, is a sum over two to the cardinal of S, uh, Elements, so it's still a polynomial, but it's maximal that we can have. Um, then the properties. So, so I defined the. Uh, I showed that M was a poset thanks to divisibility, but if you take, in this case, M S, so it means the lowest common multiple, the least common multiple of all atoms. So the sort of the biggest, the largest common multiple that you can have. If you take all the elements that divide M S. So it makes a finite lattice in this case. It's not just a poset. So a lattice is when you have, uh, it's a poset when, where you have least upper bounds and uh, greater, greatest lower bounds for any two elements, okay? Just for, I will not use this uh, really, but. Uh, so now comes the main, the so second part of the talk. I will apply my main result, the computing the growth function for this monoid, which is called the, BKL means Beerman, Co, Lee monoid. Beerman, Co, and Lee were the three authors of the original paper where this monoid was first defined. Okay. So, what are the generators? They are n choose two generators. Okay. Every pair of elements S and T, and they have some relations. Okay, which I give here. So sigma ST equals sigma UV. They commute if so. You can notice ST UV. So if if you draw it, it's white, you have white chalk. Just means that. So I will draw actually. Well, when I will picture these uh, generators, I will draw simply as arcs from S to T. Okay, I would one, two, three, four. So the first relation here means that uh, the things are like this. Okay, S and S is smaller than T, U is smaller than V. And the other one means something like this, okay? So actually this, are the co this means that the, there is no crossing between ST and UV, if I'm not mistaken, okay? So if the two generators are not crossing, if they are interpreted as arcs, then they commute. And then there's this strange condition, uh, whatever, I will not use them, okay? I will <laughs> don't need to uh, remind them. So the birman coli monoid is a good homogeneous monoid. In fact, it's a garcine monoid, as I already defined. And the least common multiple is equal to this, which I will not use either. But it's, it's just notice that this is of length n minus 1, actually. The, the maximum length that you can have is n minus 1. So we want to compute cliques. OK, we, we, we want to compute this. What we want to do is to compute this thing, OK? G actually okay now it's a Garcia monoid so all subset of S are clicks okay so we want to compute this quantity because we know that 
uh, this will be the inverse of the, the function that I gave in the, in the beginning. Uh, so we would like to know how to compute this least common multiple. So the key here is that uh, the, um, we'll give exactly the structure of the POW set. It's actually in relation with non-crossing partitions, which I will define soon. So you can exactly know how to compute, uh, how to compute the, the, the least common multiples. That is how to compute the quantities mj and to know what length they have. So a partition is non-crossing if, uh, so if, if you represent partitions like this, Okay, uh, two, three, sorry. Okay, imagine you, this would correspond to the partition one, two, four, three, five, six, so I'm, I'm in set partitions, okay? It's not crossing if there are no crossing in this kind of diagram where you join, in each block you, you join each point to the next one, okay? This would not be, if you put 3, 5, 6, like this, this would be crossing because there are two arcs that cross, okay? So, partition, and you, as usual, you, you order them by, uh, where's, where's the other one? You order them by uh, refinement so that uh, partition is smaller than another one, so we make a post set of this non-crossing partition. If each block of the, this one is contained in a block of the bigger one, okay? And this is, okay, I tell you, I, I won't prove it, it is a lattice, a ranked lattice of rank n minus 1. And actually, it's exactly the lattice we want that corresponds to the, uh, to the interval 1 ms in the birman cody monoid, okay? So this interval, where I remember the order is by divisibility, it's exactly isomorphic to the lattice of non-crossing partitions. So we want to compute the, the quantities mj, but we will do this actually in the, in the lattice because we know how this works here, okay? We have now a definite, a concrete example how to compute the, this least common multiple in, a, in, in the lattice of non-crossing partitions. So it will become more combinatorial soon. So that's what I said, the generators, you know, of the BKA monoid, sigma ST will be identified with just uh, the, the, the arc between S and T corresponding to the partition where S and T are a block and the other blocks are sing singletons. And so just to notice, if you, if in this correspondence, the, the, the length of the elements M is, actually, is equal to N minus the number of blocks in the non-crossing partition, which is exactly what is the rank in the lattice of non-crossing partitions. So just means that the, the ranks correspond in these two, okay. But I will use this later, okay. So what do I mean? I think this is the first drawing, <laughs> first picture of the, the talk. Uh, how, how do you compute the least common multiple of atoms here? So these are atoms, you need sigma 1, 3 is here, sigma 2, 4 here, sigma 5, 13, etc. So the, the least common multiple here will become, it means try to find the non-crossing partition, okay? The smallest one, I mean with the maximum number of blocks if you want, that uh, will contain, okay, the, such that each of, these, uh, each of these generators will be contained in a block, okay? So for instance, this has one and three have to be in the same block because they are we have to find a bigger, uh, bigger partition, I mean, with less blocks, two and four also. But actually, all of these have to be together because this one, three, and two, four would make a, non a crossing partition. And we, so the smallest non-crossing partition that contains all these atoms, so become, this will correspond to the least common multiple in the monoid, okay, is this one. So all of these have to be in the same block, okay, so this is just the same kind of drawing that I did here. So, but you add things like this on top. Okay, so it's nicer. <laughs> and so one, two, three, four has to be in the same block. This one will remain this block. But all of this and this have to be in the same block. And there's some crossing here with the other ones. So they have to be also, they have to form one big block together. Okay, so this is the smallest non-crossing partition 
that's uh, smallest for the for the order I mean for the refinement order that contains all of these generators okay but it's quite difficult to know when you have uh, something like this what is the number of blocks that you will obtain you see because there are some crossings etc so computing the sum sum of uh, all uh, subsets here of minus one j mj is quite complicated so we will see that it's quite easy to define the killing involution on this so there are some some terms that will disappear in the in the in the sum okay and we'll actually in the end we'll just count positive things and it will be quite easy so so this is a formula i gave before it's not really important but just remember that yeah the length corresponds to n minus number of blocks now so if you have a actually we don't want any crossings or things we want to get rid of this to compute the the series so just notice that this one okay will give exactly the same uh, non-crossing partition if you compute the risk as this one if you add this one you you stay in the same block so we we will not modify the 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 the, the non-crossing partition that i had before okay uh, don't know if you, it's here it's still the same non-crossing partition that you will obtain here okay but here notice that i added an an arc so i have one more generator okay so the click is one more so if you in the sum sum over my uh, sum of minus one uh, to the power of j mj this the two terms corresponding to this one and the previous one will kill each other because they have they correspond to the same least common multiple but they have opposite signs okay so this you have to make this precise and you can also sort of kill things like this if you have now just two arcs consecutive like this stu so this v shouldn't appear it's completely irrelevant and if you add you can do the same trick and add an arc you will stay in the same block you will define the same least common multiple but the parity will change again so you in fact you with this way you will manage to get rid of all crossings and all things like this there's a way to define precisely the involution so that it's well defined just have to be a bit careful to take exactly the first one so in this in this sums exactly this will not uh, involve all subsets like this but only the subsets where there is no crossing like this and there is no uh, consecutive arcs like this so we can make all of them disappear and the object w w what appears in the end what remains they are called non-crossing alternating forests. So you would, uh, so it looks like this. Okay, in general, non-crossing alternating forest. Non-crossing means no crossing, as you can see, and alternating means if you look at every vertex, all uh, all arcs go to the right, uh, to the left. Sorry, or all arcs go to the right, which is exactly the means that there there is no configuration like this. Okay, no more. So. Uh, so that's exactly what I said about non-crossing alternating forest. So we want to count this forest now. That's what remains. And the nice thing is um, now it's really easy to compute the, the length of the MJ in this case because the the length is exactly now the number of uh, edges that you have in the uh, in, in your forest. Okay, because w w here w when you have crossings like this, the the, the the partition uh, the non-crossing partition gets really big at the same time because you have to add many things in the same block but when you have a non-crossing alternating forest you can check easily that every time you add an edge the the, the partition will have a bigger block or, and its rank will go one higher each time so it's so so now we you will only count positive things here in general in general the, the general uh, idea is that we will not have any signs and this this is what remains that if you apply the, the okay the homomorphism if you change this by t to the length of mj what appears is that the growth function uh, is equal to the sum over all non crossing alternate i mean the sum of minus t to the k uh, from k equals 0 to n minus 1 and this is the number of non crossing alternating forests on n points okay n is fixed and k edges okay so to get the answer, we just have to compute this number. So this is purely bijective proof that we give. This, are, this is a new object, as far as I know. 
I mean, non-crossing alternating trees are known, meaning you have just one component, okay? You have n minus one edge. But this first time that this has been computed, it's a slight variation of the usual proof of non-crossing alternating trees. So here is a non-crossing alternating forest, and we want to see how many of them there are with k edges. So first, so I, I talked about this yesterday actually, but this is a non-crossing alternating tree, and it's really easy to put non-crossing alternating trees in bijection with binary trees. If you have, uh, I'll take the big one here, you cut the big arc and you make it into a binary uh, vertex, okay, and then on this, on this side, you have one other big arc you make into a binary vertex. You have things on both sides, and recursively, you can define a tree structure immediately. So when you have one component, meaning when you have a tree, okay, each component has different color here, as you can see, and you can make a binary tree. So first step is uh, construct the binary tree associated to each component and keep the labels, okay, so that you... You keep the labels on the, on the points here, meaning on the leaves of the corresponding trees. And then, and then you will assemble them together using the labels to, to form a unary binary tree, meaning a tree that has uh, leaves, uh, I mean, that has internal vertices of degrees 1 and 2. This was only degree 2, now you're allowed to have degree 1. And how to do this? You just follow... There's a way to... to how to do how to do this? Uh, you want to construct it in a way that if you follow the labels here, one, two, three, uh, if you do the, the two of the of the tree, then every time you hit a new integer, they are in the normal order. Okay? So they are one, two, three, four, and now so this corresponds to this tree, and now we want five. We want to associate five, so you put uh, a unary vertex, okay? Every time you have a new tree, okay? That will allow to join the different components, okay? And this, you want five, so you have to take this tree because it has five in it, so you attach it here. Five, so you see that there's eight here, so it means that you must attach something between the five and the eight, the one with six, seven, exactly. So there's a way to make this precise, but the idea is to use the labels here, so that they appear in an uh, increasing order in the last tree. So what you do you obtain? So uh, you go from uh, the non-crossing alternating forest with n points, okay, and k edges. And what are the unary binary trees that you obtain? They are the one with n plus k nodes and k bi binary nodes, okay. So this is quite easy to count. It's, um, I think there's a mistake here, but whatever. They are in bijection with Motskin paths, okay, that have uh, n plus k steps and n minus k horizontal steps. So this is very standard in combinatorics, the, the bijections between binary trees and Catalan paths or between unary binary trees and Motskin path, okay. I think there's a mistake in the number of horizontal steps here. I'm, so I'm sorry, it's, I don't think it's this one. It's maybe n minus k plus one, or something like this. And these are easy to count because uh, I mean, Motskin pass with a definite number of horizontal steps is just a, a shuffle between a Catalan path and some horizontal steps. So it's a product of a Catalan number uh, times a binomial coefficient. And if you multiply all of this, you get this quantity here, which is the, the, the quantity. Okay, remember we wanted to compute this. And now I say that this quantity is equal to the, all the factorials that appear here. And so in the end, we have a nice formula for the growth function of the big N monoid. Uh, it's just the inverse of this uh, quantity here. Okay. Uh, so this can be seen at the type A case of a general construction that's defined for any Coxter group. And we also managed to do this in type B with the same kind of methods. And instead of non-crossing partitions, in this case, the the, the, the the corresponding thing in type B is the symmetric non-crossing partitions. So th the partitions of 2n that are invariant when you change i to i plus n. Okay. And, and you get a very similar... Okay. It's a bit more difficult actually. But, uh, it's, uh, and you can also do it for the classical brain monoids. So in the previous talks, 
heard about braid groups generally, but there's a notion of braid monoids also, and you can get some results. They are not as pretty as this, okay? They're, you can, can get only by induction the, the formula. Okay, you don't have a gen general formula. A little bit of algebra, I have two minutes, so, <laughs> so those that don't like algebra, can <laughs> it will be very fast and very sketchy, I'm sorry. Uh, so it's actually related to the talk of um, Su Yang, Choi Su Yang yesterday, Su Yang Chao, Choi, and which is unfortunately not here today. And uh, so if you take commutative field, you have a graded algebra, they are all of the form. So this, by this I mean non-commutative, uh, I mean the free non-commutative algebra on, of K generators, uh, quotiented by a homogeneous ideal, okay. Uh, in this case, it's the Hilbert series is just the series that uh, the generating function of the di dimensions of the different pieces of the grading. And so this is very sketchy. Sorry. So A is said to be a causal algebra if K admits a resolution by uh, free A models such that the matrices of, of maps in the resolutions have coefficients in A1. I'm very sorry for this definition, <laughs> which is a bit, if you never heard about resolutions or whatever, it's a bit complicated. But it's a, quite a natural notion in a, especially in homology theory, because it has a lot of uh, different characterizations, etc. And in particular, it's, you have a dual algebra. It's a real dual. I mean, if you take the dual of the dual algebra, you come back to the original algebra. And they verify this nice relation that if you take the, this series for A and this series for A, uh, A exclamation point, taken in minus T, you obtain one. Okay. And, well, scary. I should have put <laughs> some things. Now, if you take A, the algebra of, um, it's called the monoid algebra of the BK monoid. So now it's just finite linear combinations. Instead of before, it was infinite linear combinations. It's easy to see that the Hilbert series corresponds exactly to the growth functions, okay, in this case. And you can define, okay, forget about this. There is a way to define the resolutions, a resolution based on the non-crossing alternating forest that I gave you before. So resolution just means, um, so we saw it yesterday, resolutions means you have k, you have uh, zero, means a complex that is exact. Something like this, b2, etc. So it means you have, you have maps here, d, d1, d2, something like this, d3. So there's a way to define certain maps dk so that the image of di is exactly the kernel of di minus 1. And this resolution is linear. So I showed it very fast, but linear means that the coefficients in the matrix are, uh, belong to a1. So, and the coefficients here are actually are this, just this si here. So they are the generators. And they are exactly the elements of length 1, so they will exactly belong to a1. So this it's a resolution, it's actually the same proof as the original proof at the beginning of the main theorem. The same proof works, actually. And uh, it's a linear combination because of the form of the, the decay. So this proves that the monoid algebra of uh, the birman coli monoid is a causal algebra, which actually I would like to, to know a bit more. So what, um, starts, I'm sorry. <laughs> so what is the dual algebra in this case? Uh, it's, we know it's a, uh, finite, I mean, finite dimensional algebra, but I don't really know the structure. And what can I do for the other dual brain monoids for type B? Well, type B, we can do it also. We have the same result. We have also a resolution like this. But for type D, and the best thing would be uh, for any Coxeter system, I mean, general resolution and how to, to show that for any uh, dual brain monoid, uh, any algebra of this is a causal algebra, which is our conjecture, let's say. Thanks for your attention.